I'm Dan. And I'm Alex. And welcome back to On Air with Dan and Alex. Globally ranking in the top 5%, might I still oh remind... God. Thank you guys for that. No, seriously, that that's always welcome news. I, I, I have... To think, I think I've developed a slight obsession to checking to make sure that we are still in that <laughs> top 5%, but we are firmly there, Dan. Oh my God. Guys, you know, more than the numbers, I'm just focused on the fact that Alex and I get to have a fun conversation. And for some people, for some reason, people like to listen to this. It's very, very Thank fun. God. And by the way, every week, like now, as soon as something bad happens, I'm like, cannot wait to discuss this on the podcast. <laughs> what about when something good happens? No, no, don't don't want to do it. <laughs> no. Well, I guess this brings us into what you are dying to share, because for the loyal listeners, of which I hope is the overwhelming majority of our listener demographic, you will know that Dan mentioned this last week. So I'm in the UK here until uh, tomorrow. So until Wednesday, mm. when this goes up, we're recording late on Tuesday evening. And I am flying Virgin Atlantic to leave the UK. I'm nice. so excited. Uh, so I was very excited to fly Virgin Atlantic. And after recording last week, everything was normal. Woke up the next day, everything was normal. And of course, since if you guys remember about a month ago, I told you about this maybe three weeks ago on the podcast. We were talking about how every morning, if you're flying out of Heathrow, you want to check your flights because BA especially does like a round of cancellations in the morning where they where they take a few flights out of the schedule. So wake up, everything's fine. Go to the airport, everything's fine. Check in, flying British Airways from Glasgow to London. And at 8.30, I get an email. And of course, I immediately text Alex when this happens. So the subject... What would you think if you got an email with this subject? Important okay. update regarding your flight. Immediately, I would think delay, but the airline yeah. is being the airline is being tricky with its vocabulary. So you know, you get those emails that say your departure to Barcelona has been retimed, and <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at I'm looking at this email thinking retimed. Do you want to try again? Yeah. Do, we, do we need a thesaurus here? Because the last time I checked, retimed isn't a thing in aviation. You delayed the flight, but you are <laughs> shitting it about the compensation you might owe me and 219 others. Yeah. So you get the email with the subject line, important update about your so, flight. So I now realize it's not even updated, just as important information about your flight. So oh, okay. So I, I might even think that could be to do with hand visa luggage, requirements. for example. Yeah. Yeah. Like, to me, I'm like, if I get this email, yes, it's weird to get it on the day of departure, but I would be like, we're having a, we have a very full flight. Please try to, you know, gate or check your bag, carry on bag at check-in, that kind of thing. But I was like, mm. okay, let me just click this, like, very mindlessly as I'm walking into the BA lounge. Then I scroll yeah. down and immediately I see, hello, in huge letters. We're sorry to advise your flight VS-137 has been canceled due to operational reasons. And Shit. this is a flight leaving at 6.30 p.m. So it's leaving in like 10 hours from when I get this email. And it, like <laughs> I almost had a breakdown at that point because let me just recount the previous two times I've flown through Heathrow. First time, flight is canceled. It ends up taking me, uh, I arrived in Gothenburg eight hours behind schedule and the journey yeah. took a total of like, 12, 14 hours. Oh. The next time, much easier flying from Gothenburg to Edinburgh via London, and my bags get delayed for literally no reason. We had a two and a half hour connection. Bags don't make it to Edinburgh. So oh. I'm thinking, okay, you know, this time it's got to be good. I have a long layover. My morning flight is on time. But no, somehow my flight is cancelled. <laughs> I mean, when you messaged me, okay, you said to me, Alex! And then I could only see <laughs> the subject line before I clicked to open. And I thought, dear God, there's no way. Not, not <laughs> you know, not through what this guy has been through at uh, Heathrow over the last few weeks. We're not talking historically where somebody reflects on, oh, in 2016, I was caught up in a cancellation. Either. No, you're talking about the last four weeks, yeah. right? <laughs> so 
and and I'm I'm there, you know, making jokes throughout, saying to you, "Oh, you'll be fine," or you know, "I'll give you a 10 as if I've got this power to do yeah. gate allocation at Heathrow, which by the way I don't. <laughs> and well, or well, not that I want you guys to know. Anyway, no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> and and you send me this, and I'm thinking, there's no way he's not even flying BA, so it's not even like I yes. can text my BA friends, you know, <laughs> guys. Don't Cancel take it too seriously life. when I when I joke about, you know, disruption for Dan. So I, I was shocked because also, yeah. I mean, it's that flagship route that links up central London with New York City. And it's, you know, this is this is the Virgin Atlantic route that they were born to fly, that Richard Branson set his vision out for. And also the irony, of course, is that we spent most of last week discussing pioneer Richard Branson and discussing Virgin's future plans, doing a bit of a deep dive into Virgin Atlantic that is an airline that we don't pay too much attention to, given it's not in an alliance and it's very much just focused on transatlantic travel and so on. So I was, yeah, I mean, even that, I I was left kind of speechless. And then I was messaging (laughs) you after, shortly after saying, but what now? Yeah, (laughs) and I was thinking, what now? And by the way, just for the context of this cancellation, which may, which is why it makes no sense. Like, they have many flights a day to New York. Some are on A330 Neos. One is on the A330 300, old plane with their oldest, worst business class. My flight was on their nicest A350 1000, the best aircraft they fly. And that flight ends up being the one being canceled. So, yeah. I, I went into the Virgin Atlantic app, and I checked immediately they had rebooked me and i was so confused because it was like your new departure time is 6 5 p.m and my original departure was six my d- original departure was 6 25 so i was like what what did they rebook me on what do you think they rebooked me on you were flying delta no they rebooked no. me on british airways no way. I thought they initially transferred you on to, you know, the basic kind of owner of Virgin Atlantic, Delta, yeah. who also fly across the Atlantic. They rebooked you initially on their direct competitor on the route, British yeah, Airways. without asking, just immediately on BA. And I was like, and, first and by of the all, way, let's, let's just yeah. interject before you go on to this, guys. When you are in a situation where an airline cancels your flight, let's say, for example, you are in Zurich and you're flying to London and EasyJet cancel your flight. Right. And then they say, oh, well, the next EasyJet flight is not for two days. So we're going to book you on a flight in two days. It is written into, for example, European law that no matter what, that airline has an obligation to get you to your destination one way or another. When you press book now and confirm your booking and that transaction has gone ahead, that is a contract between yourself and the airline and the airline has to deliver on that contract. What I'm trying to get at is if there is, for example, a BA flight leaving that night, British Airways being, of course, a big competitor to EasyJet, EasyJet having absolutely no relationship with them whatsoever, and there are seats available, you can go to the desk. It's difficult because you have to stand your ground, but you can say to them, you have an obligation to get me to my destination. Just because there are no seats on the next few EasyJet flights out of here is not my problem. You need to rebook me onto British Airways who have seats available. You need to pay for that ticket and get me uh, and get me on my way. So often you will have to push and push and push and speak to a supervisor and escalate, speak to whatever. But it does happen. It has to happen. Otherwise, you will be stuck. <laughs> so the funny part of Dan's scenario, of course, is that Dan automatically gets rebooked no virgin without even having to have it suggested to them you know god forbid a virgin passenger end up on their direct competitor ba virgin are all there kind of all free and relaxed and here you go dan we've booked you on british airways and we've put some money in the ba pot and the iag yeah. shareholders are happy and i didn't even ask and the like the cash <laughs> price for one of these flights is like ten thousand dollars for a one-way yeah. ticket from london to new york so i was like whoa But the most upsetting thing was, I was like, excuse me, not a single person who books Virgin Atlantic thinks, hmm, I'm glad to be rebooked on BA because every single person booking Virgin is doing it to not fly BA because you literally can't even connect anywhere on Virgin Atlantic. That's the one thing that you're doing. So for them to be rebook on BA, I'm like, I'm so sure. So you think it's, it's purely about the fact that the demographic is so different. They're not connecting passengers 
that so they've specifically chosen to fly Virgin, so it's kind of out of order that they're automatically booked on BA. Yeah, like I would say no. I don't know about you, but I would guess. I, don't know, I just I was just thinking that scenario. Virgin, if if I was booked in Virgin upper class, which I know you were, and then I immediately was rebooked on a flight that was at at almost exact earlier. same departure yeah. time, twenty minutes earlier, club suite on BA, I would take it. Yeah, yeah, There's it's no not that hesitate. bad, but it's just like, of course, you're not paying Virgin Atlantic to end up on BA, is my point. So, But the thing is, that's where your travel is different to others, isn't it? Because you obviously were, had chosen Virgin Atlantic for a reason. You're mentally prepared for it to be Virgin. I don't know if you're making a video or not about uh, on the flight. So I can imagine how much that puts everything into disarray. Yeah. So for me, I also just recorded some new <laughs> BA v- reviews. So I was like okay, this is not going to work. So I call up Virgin Atlantic as I'm boarding my flight down to London. Like Virgin Atlantic has the best phone support agents, I would say, in the world. Everyone is so knowledgeable, so helpful. They're all from Essex or Liverpool. (laughs) Yeah, they're they're empowered to make decisions, aren't they? They can actually do something. Yeah, they're so awesome. So I said, here's what I was thinking. I need to review a flight. I was going to review Virgin Atlantic. So before I call, I'm frantically going on Expert Flyer where you can see seat maps on pretty much any flight. And I was checking every flight this evening, tomorrow on Virgin Atlantic or Delta because I was trying to see, are there any that have window seats or even two seats together? And none of them did except a flight the next day at 10.50 a.m. on Delta. So I was like... Oh, the reason I I was in such a hurry to get to New York, too, is that I was supposed to land on the evening before my dad's 70th birthday. So I was like, I can't diddle daddle and stay stay in London for long. I need to get my ass to New York. So because I said to you, why don't you just fly on the same flight the following day and just, you know, Virgin will cover the hotel. and That's that. Yeah, not an option. And by the way, here's where it also gets very interesting, because I asked to be rebooked to Delta on that flight because... Virgin Atlantic was not an option. There was no good seats for my review. And the bonus of that flight, considering I'm someone who orders special meals, this is something I always have to consider is, well, if I get rebooked, will I not get my meal? Because that's also an important part when I'm making a video. So the bonus of this flight is it's leaving in more than 24 hours so I can request the meal. Um, Mm -hmm. So I get rebooked on that flight. The agent gives me a booking reference. So as I'm sitting there on my BA flight, trying to like manage my Delta booking, it's saying no booking exists, no booking exists. So I go, this is so weird, but I guess, you know, it hasn't been ticketed yet. It's been requested. It shows up on Virgin on the app. So I took off to London, not knowing what's going to happen. I land in London and the second we touch down, it's like it's 1040 and the flight is leaving the next day at 1050. So I have 10 minutes to try to confirm this special meal. So I quickly call back Virgin Atlantic. They pick up instantly. Love that. Super helpful person again. She goes, oh, the previous agent gave you the wrong booking reference for Delta. This is the real one. So I go, oh. So I get that booking reference. Log on to Delta. At this point, it's like 1048. I zoom into the special meal section. Request special meal. Request sent. Okay. Then... I figure, okay, let me just call Delta to try to confirm. So I call Delta and reach them at like 10.55. The agent goes, the most unhelpful person ever, especially after talking to Delta or to Virgin. He's like, yeah, no, um, there's no special meal or order here. I go, uh, no, there should be. I have it requested on my end. No, nothing here. Can you please help me request it? No, it's less than 24 hours before. Uh, no, but I just submitted the request more than 24 hours before. No, you have to do it 48 hours before. I'm like, Uh. you just told me 24 hours. No, it's 24 to 48 hours. So I was getting nowhere. I hang up, call Virgin again. The agent's like, oh yeah, love, I see the vegetarian meal request (laughs) from my end. Um, hope it's all fine. And then I asked, by the way, like, will I get hotels and stuff covered? And then it's like, unfortunately, since you elected to change flights, 
I probably won't. Which Ooh, makes sense, but it's an interesting you, thing to note did, here, right? They did offer you a valid alternative. You were booked onto that competitor. You were booked onto BA. You were booked onto a flight that was at 20 minutes earlier. So in yeah. our eyes, they've covered themselves. So for you then to be really picky and say, you know what, I want to go tomorrow. Well, that was never the plan because they were never putting you in that position, right? Yeah, it is interesting. I'm going to try to still request because my argument here is like, Thank you for rebooking me. I'm not seeking EU compens or I guess UK two for one compensation, but yeah. at the same time, again, I didn't book Virgin Atlantic to be rebooked on BA. I was trying to fly with at least one of your partners, and I'm sure this actually ended up being more financially better for them that I rebooked to Delta. So yeah. we'll see what they say. I end up flying Delta the next day. And arrive in New York. The Delta flight was very interesting. I'm posting a video from that soon. But the whole thing, basically, I was on the phone four or five times in the span of a few hours. Everything was so chaotic. And, like, the pressure of having to review a flight and something goes wrong again. And I'm just like, this cannot be happening. And then when they Delta said they couldn't see the meal, which, by the way, ended up being true. There was no special meal after all that. Um, well, no, yeah, so you it was had just... a long daytime flight with no food that you can eat. Well, I, of course, I was like, I'm not going to risk it. So I bought like yeah. a ton of stuff at Pret and I bought one of those like Yule uh, meal replacement drinks, you know, which tastes quite good. So I had so much food and then they still ended up having like some stuff I could eat on the menu. So it all ended up working out quite well. But after we were rebooked, after all that was sorted, we had a great day in London, but Oh my gosh, it's just like, sometimes I think... I, don't, I just don't know what, how, what, how we go from here with, with you and Heathrow now. You know, yeah. I, I've, I've tried my best with, with you both, <laughs> okay? And it just seems that, I don't know, I don't know. We've, it's not working out. I feel out. like the mediator, it's just not working out. And, you know, it's not you, but it's not Heathrow. Heathrow says it's you yeah. and you say it's Heathrow. No, it is Heathrow. <laughs> it's definitely not me. <laughs> Okay, well, let's not or point the fingers be... because in our last session that didn't get us anywhere. Okay, we don't. <laughs> so, but... <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm definitely cursed, but this only happens to me at Heathrow. That's what's weird. Like, I never have delayed or canceled flights anywhere else. My luggage never gets lost, even on yeah, crazy okay. itineraries. I don't, know, I don't but... know if you should be stating this as a fact on the <laughs> podcast because why am it's I having happen. visions of next week's episode where <laughs> yeah. I'm saying... You might remember Dan mentioning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, somehow dear. I've still been in one place all week. I haven't flown, but I still had flights get canceled and <laughs> luggage get lost. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and all of them related to Heathrow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> listen, you're going to be fine. There's going to be a there's there's going to be a new fresh start for you and Heathrow sometime soon. I don't know when. Is it, is it next week? Is it 2028? I'm not sure, but we... Uh, <laughs> We'll work on it. I mean, you can't avoid Britain's only hub airport, Dan. It's not I know. And the thing is, I like Heathrow mm. when things go well. Like, I like the stores. I like the restaurants. Yeah. I like the variety of airlines. I like the lounges. Good shopping, decent yeah. lounges. I, I just Amazing don't selection like... of airlines. So yeah. many A380s. The best products that you can find all around the world. Genuinely a hub airport in order to make connections across the alliances, notably One World and Star. Yeah. Yep. It, it's definitely got its benefits. It needs a third <laughs> runway, but I don't know if we'll even get that in our lifetime, let alone, uh, you know, yeah. anytime soon. I'm I feel like sure. most of the problems I'm bringing up now are because of the, la the lack of a third runway. But I had some messages from Virgin Atlantic um, pilots or crew who said my Virgin Atlantic flight was probably cancelled. Nothing to do with Heathrow, it just happens to be part of my curse, but probably cancelled due to their cruise shortage. Ah, pilot, well, we seeing, pilot shortage. Sorry. Yeah, I'm definitely seeing a few airlines come into a little bit of disruption territory over the last week. And I would say that's as we move into real actual summer now, Yeah, because we're now past the midway point of June. So with the exception of, for example, the UK schools that are still on, a lot of Europe has already broken up or is breaking up. 
and you've just got a lot of uh, travel coming into into peak flows and then you start to see all those pressures on crew shortage and so on uh, the data that i am constantly re- it's actually the first thing i do in the morning now is, is check how things are performing uh, in different markets and still uh, this june so far compared with last june and the june before which was a chaotic shit show june 2022 <laughs> Uh, that's when literally nobody arrived with that bag. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> that was the renaissance of the air attack. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, this June so far is holding up pretty well. Knock on wood. The uh, performance in most markets is pretty stable. But there are some airlines that didn't have disruption a few weeks ago that are now facing the disruption. It's usually just due, it's usually just due to lack of manpower. Yeah. But I will, I, we've spoken about this so many times, but I find it so interesting and crazy that flights are just emptier. Like they, my Delta flight yeah. sold out in business as always on US airlines. Economy was like one third full. My Virgin Atlantic flight that got canceled, business sold out, economy class also very empty. So there's so many flights that, we hear things are full, but in fact, that's not the full story. We did touch on that, didn't we? And I think that it, it is true that so far, when I look at the loads as well, for example, I just, my friend flew to Paris yesterday and he said to me, I'm going to upgrade uh, using miles at check-in. And immediately, you know, without even having to check, I'm thinking, oh, it's Sunday not in June. Happen. And, okay, yeah. Of course, of course not going to happen. And I said to him... You're stupid because you you go to the airport expecting that it's just going to be possible and you're going to redeem 40,000 avios or whatever, 20,000 avios to fly from Doha to Paris when uh, it's going to be full. uh, And as I'm saying it and I'm checking, I can see that the flight is empty in both cabins. And I was thinking, huh? June? I mean, that's okay. I think a lot of people will be avoiding Paris because they think that the Olympics is now or three months worth or they just think, oh, the, you know, Olympics not dealing with that. And so they're avoiding, even though the Olympics is, there's still quite some time before it begins and it's not mm-hmm. that long either. But um, so then I looked at other routes and Milan, kind of similar, Rome, kind of similar. You know, let's say it's a route that there are three flights a day. One of them is busy. The other two are empty. And yeah. that was not the case this time last summer. But of course, there are few, there, there are less people that are able to use vouchers this summer. That's now mm, kind of the voucher true. era is over. You know, everyone that had vouchers 2020, 2021, even 2022, some had vouchers that were issued towards the end of 2022 that yeah. they were able to use right up until this year. But of course, this year is the cutoff. Um, so yeah. definitely, yes. I think we're, we're seeing... We're seeing the end of that. Yeah. There, of course, have been economic struggles in different markets that we've documented. That's playing a role. Yeah, but we've, it's just, we've been, it, but it is quieter. We've been saying, or like people have been saying to me, sponsors and all types of people, oh, a recession is coming on. Like we've been hearing that for years. So it's not like that affected demand in the past few years. But no. just because you said, just because you said this, I'm checking a few different flights. Like Heathrow to Doha taking off in less than an hour business is less than half full we have paris to doha taking off in fifth in 10 minutes business class is less than half full and these are routes where the seat map could have been full a week in advance two years ago more more yeah i can remember i can remember most athens flights in summer 2022 in april so the april before the summer of 2022 so let's say like two months in advance or even three months in advance they were full. They were sold out. You could not get a seat. And I remember this vividly because we had a wedding. So it was fixed on, you know, when we needed to be there for. And I remember being shocked. At, I was thinking, how am I sitting on the 1st of April looking at the 1st of July? And yeah. there is nothing, nothing. Crazy. And, uh, uh, but of course, that was everyone from 2021 that had it cancelled. And you remember the horror stories of the green list and the red list and the bands and the all sure. of that. You know, I'm so <laughs> glad we're, yeah, I'm so glad we're over that. But but uh, yeah, things are definitely quieter out there in terms of load factors. And we can, I guess we can have a nice deep dive all being one well September, October when we get some solid summer data to, to see if, if we were right. But I think we know that we're right because we're able to see the live loads on so many different airlines through through the system. And as you as you just note now, 
flights that are departing tonight are going with cabins that are that are half empty. That's that's unusual yeah. in terms of it's not following the trend that we've seen over the last two years. Which least. is obviously bad for airlines, amazing for passengers. So well, I see no, it as I a mean, win. Passengers <laughs> are going uh, you, to, you, of course, you see it as a win and also, you know, the extra space and the passengers will think, okay, maybe they've got more chance of being able to stretch out. And do you know what? Anecdotally, just the other day, somebody was telling me, what route were they flying? Again, something super... Oh, where are they flying? I think it was I think it was New York Athens. Yes, that's an Emirates route, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And they were saying how, yeah, oh, and they love the flight and blah blah blah. And it's a shame it wasn't an A380 because it's not as triple seven. But uh it, there were so many rooms that they that he was stretching out on the row four in the middle. And I remember thinking, well, that's you know, that's only, that row of four was never empty when I last looked. So yeah. <laughs> things are uh, things are definitely different. But look, that brings us nicely to some of the headlines, and specifically actually with Emirates. Of course, this uh, is a development that I was all over because of the way that this meets geopolitics and how everything in aviation is so intertwined and inherently exposed to what happens in the world. So Emirates have been fined 1.8 million US dollars. Okay, that's not so much for an airline that makes multi-billions, but it's still, you know, more than your average parking fine. (laughs) 1.8 million US dollars by US authorities because of how they operated some of their flights in Iraqi airspace. So we fly routinely over and through Iraqi airspace and uh, Iranian airspace. And these are two very big key overflight regions for travel between East and West. And sometimes these airspace areas close during times of escalated conflict or threats of some kind of attack or, you know, when we get those Iran tensions, those Iraq tensions, whatever that tends to then fizzle out by the next morning and everything goes back to normal. That's not why they were fined. They were fined because Emirates flights that were flying between December 2021 and August 2022, so not that that long, were overflying Iraqi airspace with a JetBlue code share flight number, ultimately making it a US flight by code share by way of code share as well as just an emirates flight and of course JetBlue and emirates have this agreement but under u.s law because of the sanctions on iran and also because of the lack of commercial agreements and political agreements with iraq it is prohibited for a u.s carrier designation code to be flown in territory where there is no real agreement there. And that's why Emirates have been slapped with this ban. So the the interesting thing here, right, is that it's not the fact they're using Iraqi airspace, but it's the fact that, wait, it's Iraq or Iran? It's Iraqi airspace. But yeah. go on, you make a very important yeah. distinction. You're about so, to talk about how they were flying, right? Exactly, because the fact they were using it specifically with Iraq wasn't the problem, but it's the fact no. that they were flying under um, 32,000 feet, right? Which is so yeah. interesting because it brings in the question of, did the pilots even necessarily know they weren't allowed to fly under 32,000 feet when going specifically to the US? Probably not, because this restriction doesn't apply to all Emirates flights, okay? So it only applies to the Emirates flights that code share with US airlines. Now, pilots are not, with the million things that they have to do, they're not actively thinking about what this flight is code sharing with around the world. This is something that the crew announced when you board and they say, welcome on board this flight, Emirates, in partnership or in code share with JetBlue, blah, 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 blah. And so on. So I would I would say that the pilots didn't know. And the reason why the altitude works is because sometimes U.S. Uh, regulator, the FAA, will determine that, for example, this airline, for example, a U.S. carrier, can fly over this territory, such as Afghanistan or Iraq or Iran, providing it is above thirty three thousand feet or above thirty eight thousand feet 
or and the reason why they do that is because there are all these kind of risk assessments but they think aircraft are safer at that altitude from god forbid something like a ground uh, surface to air missile or something like that so that's where these these restrictions come in of course these flights were flying most of the time above 32,000 feet because Emirates operate 777 and 380s and so typically they would be cruising higher than that anyway but at times we're having to descend for normal reasons perhaps weather air traffic and so on below 32,000 feet and on every flight that a jet blue flight number as a part of a code share was on this Emirates flight and it descended below 32,000 feet over Iraq, bam, they were hit with a fine. And these fines have racked up, racked up, racked up. Yeah. And so that's an interesting specific situation. But I find it so interesting in the more general context that once you once you learn about this, you realize, for example, all Middle Eastern airlines will have code shares. Well, the ones that have U.S. partners will have code shares to the East Coast, like even to Florida or perhaps to Chicago. But they will not have code shares on flights to the West Coast, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, because those flights use Iranian airspace. And any airlines that are using Iranian airspace are not allowed to code share with the US airline on that flight. That is correct. And I know of many airlines that end up being fined because somehow through planning, it was missed. It was just, you know, there was a lack of oversight there. And suddenly you had an Alaska Airlines flight number on a flight that was originally not supposed to pass through Iranian airspace. And then it did. And then they were fined because the US have said, no, you cannot have a US designated code of a US airline, a US commercial, you know, company on a, on a, in an airspace territory of a country that they have no bilateral agreement with, that they simply do not either recognize the current regime or you know are actively sanctioning like iran and so on and for example qatar airways in doha so they're allowed to use russian airspace as a well all middle eastern airlines are allowed to use russian airspace and they do but not on routes where it code shares with the us either so when you're flying qr and you're flying for example to new york most of the time you can have an american airlines flight number on your or JetBlue or whoever, you can have that flight number on your flight as part of a code share because that route will avoid Russian airspace because it's able to go, for example, over Europe and that way towards New York. Yeah. But if you fly like I did a few months ago to LA, you are definitely using Russian airspace more often than not. Therefore, they have to drop the code share flight number on that flight i mean isn't it just uh, surely this is a part where passengers or listeners are thinking how is this actually a thing to talk about things that people just don't consider and the u.s by the way knows you know it's keeping a track of all of this and it is actively fining for specific flights that dipped below 32,000 feet that had the jet blue flight number on it as part of this you know not the main flight number this wasn't a JetBlue flight, just the code share, but it was enough to break the law. Yeah. It's funny. I almost imagine them sitting there, like, just waiting for someone to make a mistake and then be like, ka because there are so many things in the system. I want to know, what do you think about the argument that U.S. carriers, or I guess their unions, are trying to push that no airlines flying to the U.S. should be allowed to use Russian aerospace, for example, because they get a competitive advantage over U.S. carriers by doing so. I don't believe that there is a competitive advantage. I just think this is another kind of traditional old cry like they used to cry about how they were never able to compete because they used to say, look at their amazing first class cabins. You know, we, we can never have the money to invest in that. And actually, finally, most of these airlines have invested in very decent, solid cabins <laughs> and since then have been quiet and have not just been quiet, have jumped into bed with Gulf carriers. Look at look at United and Emirates. You know, United used to lobby as hard as it could down in D.C. against the likes of Emirates. And, and now they're in bed with them. Yeah, it's uh, I, I don't think there's a competitive advantage. I, I do think it, you know, we are in a weird world where. For example, it's a no-go zone for a European carrier. It's a definitely a no-go zone for an American carrier. 
but some South American carriers are welcome all the way on the other side of the of the earth. Yeah, in a, in Russian airspace, you've got many Asian carriers who are just kind of shrugging off, and they, you know, what war, and they're able to <laughs> just con- continue as usual, and they don't really get a look in. I always think it's the Asian carriers that get away with it, to be honest. Yeah. I think there's a lot of attention on the Gulf carriers when, mm. you know, people want, when people used to have that argument about state-owned airlines. Nobody wanted to talk about Singapore Airlines. Nobody yeah. wanted to talk about <laughs> Finnair. You know, it was just, it wasn't on the on the table. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It is, a, as someone who always advocates for the consumers, I just find it so frustrating when it's like, yeah, no one likes the fact that U.S. airlines or European airlines or whatever else cannot use Russian airspace. No one likes that. Europeans who have to fly on European airlines don't like that. But at least don't try to take away the ability to fly from Hong Kong to New York direct, for example. Don't try to take away the the ability to fly from India to the U.S. West Coast direct by banning Air India and Cathay Pacific from using Russian airspace as well. You're just inconveniencing so many people for no reason. And if you think, okay, I'm comfortable, I'm fine with using Russian airspace, then let people do it. I do have these visions of Senator Lindsey Graham or any of the others, you know, when there's a flight that's going to need to divert to Russia, because it will have to happen, you know, there are medical situations every day and so on. I'm just imagining him, you know, in the, is he in the Senate? Yeah, I think so. (laughs) Yes. And uh, yes, he's senator, isn't he? You know, why was this aircraft ever there? You know, this kind of attitude about why were Americans put at risk and all of this. uh, Yes. You know, it's uh, bound. It's inevitable, isn't it? Because we we do where it's so easy, I think, in in the West for them to just pack up this idea of this is how it is now. and, And everyone avoids Russia and there's no question about it. And it's like, knock, knock, who's there? Turkish Airlines. You know? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And uh, so, yeah, it's an interesting one. Well, look, we also uh, had some news just before we started recording. And uh, so this is nice and timely. And I suspect that by the time we even publish this episode, there may have been a, a development. But it does seem clear now that the European Commission will give the green light to Lufthansa's purchase of a 325 million euro stake in Italy's Ita Airways after finally being able to convince the European Commission that it's going to be fine in terms of competition. So I really wanted to know what did they say? How did how did yeah. Lufthansa and specifically Karsten Spohr, how did how did he convince the European Commission apart from being kind of a European bureaucrat himself mm. in in many ways how how was he able to uh, to get this over the line because the european commission do try to be the champion of the consumer at least by their image you know they're the we brought usbc for everyone we did this for you and we're, we're yeah. in control of apple and we we have the big companies you know we're calling the shots and with airlines they're trying to be a bit similar, right? And and show that we're on the side of the consumer. We want competition. We want low fares and so on and so on. But it seems clear that Lufthansa, who already rule Europe, are about to scoop up a significant 40 plus percent stake in ETA. Um, Dan, when I looked at these concessions, what do you think? The first thing is, is that they have promised that they will give competitor airlines many, many more slots at Milan's Lenate Airport. Great. ITA yeah. doesn't even have a huge presence there, so that's so helpful for everyone. Well, well nobody does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to be clear, I mean, okay, foreign long-haul carrier who flies to Milan Lenate. I can't think. No. Even, so Fly Dubai flies to Bergamo, not even Lenate, <laughs> but they wow. fly from Dubai to Bergamo. This wow. is so, this is, Okay, ITA is obviously, you know, it's the new version of Alitalia, which was losing money for years. So if this helps them survive, that's good news in a way. But I hate to, you know, be the one to talk bad about Lufthansa Group every single episode, but being taken over by Lufthansa Group, come on, what are they going to do to them? They're going to rename it City something, aren't they? It's going <laughs> to be... Lufthansa City Italy Airlines. It's going to be City IT Airways. And it's yeah. like, what is it? Because it's, it's not going to be as obvious as City 
City Italy or something. It's just going to be like City <laughs> Airlines dot it. Yeah, yeah, it's a different <laughs> yeah. airline. It's a different <laughs> airline. What I thought was interesting. I mean, some political notes to this, and you know, I'm across the whole kind of political stuff that's happening. So Ursula von der Leyen is a little at risk. Okay, and she is moving around Europe, kind of in search, drumming up support for her own position, and. A lot of that is her trying to win over Georgia Maloney, the uh, leader of Italy, uh, in terms of obtaining her support for Ursula's position at the top of uh, of of Europe and of Brussels and of the European Commission. So Italy has been pressuring pretty hard on the European Commission to allow this deal with ETA to go ahead, reinstating and further emphasizing that it lacks sufficient funds to even keep f- for even being able to continue to finance ETA. Now, I would say that there must be something in Ursula von der Leyen's head there as part of that, you know, they both need something from each other. And so when I started to realize how much actually that Ursula is kind of reliant on the support of the likes of Italy and Georgia Maloney, I'm thinking that puts her in quite a strong position to be able to say, listen, you need me. And I need you. And then, surprise, surprise, we get to this week and Br- Financial Times released the headline, Brussels is set to clear Lufthansa's purchase of the 40 plus percent stake in Italy's ETA Airways. And why am I not surprised? Yeah, it is interesting that they still keep losing so much money because they have an efficient fleet. They just relaunched in a much more supposedly cost efficient way. They operate in a market where tourism is booming. And I guess business travel isn't all too bad. There's a lot of people who are still paying for premium cabins for leisure travel as well. It's not too competitive on flights to Italy either. So how can they just bleed money like this? I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to do a deeper dive into that because there are other headlines to uh, (laughs) to go to. But this is not a story that is going uh, that is going anywhere. Boeing and Airbus, of course, back in the headlines. Well, Boeing has never been out of the headlines, and there's so much that has happened. We've had we've had an incident with Southwest with a Dutch roll, essentially a maneuver that has has uh, that has caused damage to the structural integrity of. Yep, you guessed it, a Boeing seven three seven Max. We had another seven three seven, again with Southwest coming within four hundred feet of the ocean because of something that is still being investigated, but is likely pilot error in that. So many things, so many investigations that are underway, of course, is all super concerning, especially this one, because this affects both manufacturers. Boeing and Airbus have both now had to launch their own separate investigations after parts that were made with titanium that come from a supplier that they both use, known as Spirit Aero Systems. We've spoken about them before. They're based in Kansas. They've struggled also with bad quality issues over the last year. They have obtained titanium from this supplier that originated in China, and they have since learned that the documentation to certify that these parts are legit, that they have been created in line with the standards that are required to uphold our safest industry ever, those documents were counterfeit. They were faked, falsified documents. We're learning this now. These parts are already in aircraft flying globally. What do both manufacturers do? (laughs) I feel like at this point, your your mom and sister listening to this are just going to be like, you know what? That's it. I'm taking a car next time. <laughs> I feel like there's many people that, that feel like this because, look, I'm, I, I, how do we reassure? We reassure that there there are regulations in place, that it is the safest industry ever, that it is, thankfully. But, of course, every little thing is being reported and noticed now because in each area of the sector, no no stone is being left unturned because of what we're finding out and continuing to find out about Boeing. With this specific scenario that I just spoke about and with the titanium parts that were that had documents that were counterfeit, Boeing have said that they will not be suspending any deliveries, but they will remove the titanium parts from aircraft that are waiting to be delivered, so that are still as part of the factory in terms of still in production. 
but it will not pause deliveries and also any in-service aircraft will continue to fly with these uh, with these parts that had falsified counterfeit documents. Great. <laughs> Airbus have said that it is, quote, aware of the situation and that numerous tests have been performed on the parts that have come from this same source, the same supply. On Airbus, it they use it uh, on the wings and the engine pylons for the A220. So it's only on the A220 program. They said that the tests that they've done show that the A220's airworthiness, so whether or not it's you know airworthy, certified to fly, fit to fly, remains fully intact and that the company was working with the supplier. They also said, which reassured me a bit, and I hope it reassures the listeners, that the tests conducted show that the correct titanium alloy was used so that there is no question really on whether or not these parts were structurally you know different or weaker or whatever that actually it's the correct titanium alloy that was used it's just that the documents were faked mm. and so that that's you know i mean I'm trying to i'm trying to sound yeah. reassuring but it just <laughs> sounds rubbish doesn't it i just feel like sometimes data doesn't help like you just you just need to do it and then see how it feels like you just need to hop on a flight get it over with so i'm thinking about like i'm considering getting lasik which is like where you do you know what that is of course i know what it is that's where they hold your eye open while they do it yeah yeah they basically change your eye surgery yeah Yeah. basically you don't need glasses after you've done it and I was reading, please share your experiences with this, guys, over DM if you have any. But I was reading about like the risk of going blind because that's something I've been so scared of. And I've been reading Reddit and I was looking up different stats. And then I found like a, an official stat that about one in five million, your chance is one in five million of going blind. And then it's like, so you're more, it said you're more likely to die from falling out of bed. So my reaction to that is like, Oh my God, I'm that likely to die from falling out of bed. (laughs) So instead of like getting caught, I think it's just like once you have an idea that something maybe is risky or it's not a risk you're willing to take, any statistics like don't really help. They don't come for you. Statistics sometimes don't help. Yeah, it's, you know, and the whole thing about, oh, well, you're more likely to be eaten by a shark. Yeah, well, I don't live in Australia. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) uh, And I don't tend to swim off of the coast of Miami either. You're quite near to my, oh, Dan, you're on the East Coast. Don't go swimming. (laughs) Don't go swimming. I'll pull up some stats right now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I will tell you exactly how. Right, well, look, let's go into Q&A because we, we've uh, we've got a bunch to get through. So Anthony has an interesting question here. He shares a story just today about um, pro-Trump activist claims MAGA hat discrimination in American Airlines first class. And I kind of, so he asks, what do we think about this? It leads to an interesting discussion about what do we think about people wearing things with obvious political statements or cabin crew wearing things with political statements on flights and then facing backlash for it what what is the right thing to do should you wear political things or should you keep it neutral alex as an employee you're you're speaking about from from okay from both sides what do you think or the i think the passenger can wear whatever they want you know as long as it's as long as they're covered yeah i think they can wear (laughs) what they want and i i think that a passenger would take that risk uh, to wear, for example, a Make America Great Again cap in a restaurant where it may be divisive or they may come across somebody with the opposing view. And I think an aircraft is no different except you're in a confined space. So, you know, I don't think you should be trying to rock the boat, poke the bear, those kind of things. But I think it's, you know, it's a free world generally and uh, (laughs) they should be able to wear what they want. I don't think it's healthy in this kind of TikTok culture of everyone getting their phones out and wanting to start on, you know, or cause trouble based on something like something as divisive as uh, the US election coming up. Yeah. So that's the side of the kind of consumer side. The employee side, I don't think, I I just think we should not know. Okay, like yeah. we, they should be objective. We should not know 
their politics. We should not. I think specifically politics is, and I'm really it's in the US, isn't it? But specifically politics is the big one here, isn't it? Because if you have a very, you know, Democrat demographic flying between New York and LA and, uh, you know, the avocado toast route and, <laughs> and then you've got, you know, flight attendants with MAGA pins on their, you know, on their uniform or whatever. I just don't think that's appropriate. I think immediately you're just, you're somehow passive aggressively insinuating a certain, you know, belief, political motivation, whatever that then can, is just going to, it's just not going to be easy. And yeah. it's just going to add to the complexity of it. What do you think? I agree when I, I totally agree when it comes to the crew. And I think whatever it is, it doesn't even have to be political. Just don't wear a pin. Like, even if it's the most, even if it says like, love everyone, it's like, let's just like, keep it neutral. You're here to do your job, not to send a political message. And everything you say, I'm speaking from experience as Mm. someone who works on social media, will offend someone. Everything, the most positive thing. There's always somebody someone. ready to be offended. There's always someone ready to be offended at even just how you say good morning or how yeah. you know whatever. There's and just can, somebody ready. And can I just clarify that it's not always just quote unquote snowflakes, as some people would say who get offended. Everyone <laughs> can get offended by all types of stuff. So I say no to the crew doing that. I say yeah, passengers wear whatever you want, but don't expect to not be treated differently if you're wearing something that is controversial. Like, Mm. yes, people should do their job, but at the end of the day, cab and crew are humans who are at their job. They're not just, you know, a a machine on autopilot. There's a great episode from one of my favorite shows ever, Curb Your Enthusiasm, where Larry David, the main character, is he wants to like get out of a meeting with someone he doesn't like. And he's realized that the way to become like a social pariah in LA is to wear a MAGA hat. So he goes out in a MAGA hat to the meeting he has set up with this guy because he knows he's going to leave immediately if he gets seen in public with a guy wearing a MAGA hat. So Larry is like, great, problem solved. So the point is just that like, wear what you want, but ultimately people also might react to it. Of course, they shouldn't say something bad, or whatever, even if you don't agree, but you might not get as friendly service as someone else, for example. Did you know about the Delta pilots that refused to say Delta ever since? No. The, yeah, so, for example, they, w- they would use an alternative phrase. Have you not heard this before? I'm sure some of our listeners know this. So I believe it's it's a certain kind of, it's a certain group of pilots at delta that have been there from before delta was delta these are the eastern pilots right and many of them until now it's it's documented as recently as last month they refuse to say delta they instead say dixie so for example when they're speaking on air traffic control some because you know us air traffic control is very easy to listen to it's all over the internet and so on some some people catch them saying, um, yeah, you know, uh, Hartsford Jackson, this is a uh, Dixie three two two. We're turning left, at, and or, or that when actually they mean Delta, or they some have even said it on the PA and to passengers, and they'll say, welcome aboard this blah blah blah, uh, Dixie four nine eight going to Los Angeles, and it's like, well, Dixie That's is not an actual <laughs> thing. You work for. Delta, yeah. but this, uh, yeah, and there's there's uh, there's a whole bunch of threads where people kind of say, I was on a flight where uh, this taxiway was referred to as Dixie instead of Delta, and uh, and I'm and not this even going to just... ask what that's about. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's to do with them being uh, upset about ultimately what eventually happened to the company that they worked with and how it was absorbed and it's become the the delta that we know today and so Mm. on there's a whole whole thing there but but that's interesting and they also say that it's you know that's being a little bit kind of workplace political rather than political political yeah yeah no it's interesting the other thing that you said that made me laugh is when you said about how hey it's not just snowflakes 
It always cracks me up if I'm if I turn on something like Fox Business or Fox News. Guaranteed, you only have to watch it for ten minutes. There is somebody complaining about how the mainstream media don't cover or don't show or don't give us the airtime. I'm like, you are on the most yes. mainstream <laughs> of channels ever. Constantly complaining about how you have no, ma- it doesn't get more mainstream than that. Not in the US. Yeah. Even I'm watching it and I'm outside the US. By the way, I don't watch it. For example, if I know an airline CEO is going to appear on Fox Business or something, but yeah. Fox News isn't really my cup of tea. Yeah. Okay. So I have a question here from James also. Hi, Dan. Always love hearing the banter between you and Alex. He's better at roasting you, so you need to step it up a notch. Ouch. <laughs> you I mean, are this guy speaks the truth also yeah. don't don't go to bed tonight trying to think about trying to step it up you can't and you will <laughs> never be able to so yeah. just you know go with how you are you're comfortable with it aren't you right yeah i'm just yep. a nice Good. person okay. you know so yeah yeah I, okay cool anyway he says i was recently chatting with friends about airline alliances like you two i think one world is the most valuable for status benefits mm-hmm. however despite my long time loyalty one thing still disappoints me about one world is the Visible gaps on maps in terms of routes, minimal airline Mm. choices, or presence on a couple of continents. What is an airline that's currently alliance-less that we would like to see in one world? And what's another that we would like to see switch teams? Oh my god, that requires thought. I'm having to pull up a map. (laughs) Yeah, me too. Uh, too. (laughs) hmm. That is difficult. I mean, what are the... I wish you told me this before so I could probably think about this to give a more insightful <laughs> answer. But what are the airlines that are alliance so, less? First? Actually, news it, this week know? was that Starlux yes. wants to join One World. Starlux does want to join One World, but they've only, Starlux is only about five minutes old. So, yeah. you know, they're not. <laughs> and they have like almost no roots. So it's not. Yeah, the they're most literally exciting. a newborn. Yeah. But would be great if they joined Star- uh, One World, ne- nevertheless. But, you know, they take a seat. There are other airlines that also want yeah. that for them, and they've been around for, for decades. Hmm. I think uh, it's such a shame that LATAM isn't in One World I, anymore because... that I, I was literally about to say LATAM. LATAM, the fact that it's not in One World is just a bit of a joke. And the fact there are no alliance at all, like, come on, it's useless. South America is just a big gaping disappointment when it comes to alliances. I know, I know. Um, I would what say else? a lot of South America, Azul, could be quite good in somewhere like Star Alliance. yeah. That yeah, that's cool. true. Honestly, yeah, South America is the big hold, the big place we need one. Azul is a good airline, so I think that would be nice. Who would you like to jump ship? I would like SAS and Star Alliance, personally. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. From September 1st. <laughs> <laughs> I would like, what do I want in one world? I, I'm specifically thinking about one world here, but mm. what about like, why not? This will obviously never happen, but why not add like Austrian Airlines to the mix or something like that? Oh, okay. I've thought of one who should be in Star Alliance, Etihad. Yeah, which they're kind of inching closer toward Sky Team. So, yeah. So that could be interesting. We'll see what Riyadh Air ends up doing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, oh, oh, okay. I would love to take Singapore Airlines out of Star and put them in one world. Yes, (laughs) yes, same. (laughs) That would be a dream. Thai, so it's still okay, but yeah, Thai can do it. And hey, Starlux, Thai and Starlux in in, uh, Star Alliance. That's fine. (laughs) At the same time, who would you eject and you wouldn't care? Who would you knock out? (laughs) (laughs) There's so many airlines I would eject from every alliance that I don't care about at all. (laughs) Qantas, you can go to Star. I don't care. No, hey, Qantas <laughs> no, is good we need that. for no, a one no, world. We need them. The, the kangaroo route, you are you a are vital yeah. player. Oh, okay. Oh, my God. I mean, we spoke about, we've been talking about them all podcast. Okay, one of the huge airlines that is alliance-less, that would be incredible for global travelers, is, of course, Emirates. Yeah, and they would be good in Star Alliance. Mm. Out of all airlines, they would be a huge amazing addition to star alliance by the way the biggest switch the most necessary switch would be to have delta switch spots with american so put american and sky that team would be great but delta in one world i don't think it's happening but that would be great no. um selfishly i'd like Aegean in one world i feel like that could be nice like a, a stronger yeah european carrier that isn't iag who else? JetBlue I'd put in one world <laughs> in, my, yeah. uh, in my alliances. That would be good. A good Who Chinese. Like, let's put 
yeah. China, Air China, or some no, airline China. further north in one China, world. Yeah, China southern in one world. Yeah, but yeah. they're they're based in Guangzhou, which is basically by Hong Kong. So it's like yeah, true, not Cafe the most 2.0. useful. Yeah, well, definitely. So I mean, it could be super interesting to have someone like Rwanda in in one world. Yeah. Oh my、like、god, Alex! We completely forgot about Philippine Airlines needs to be in an alliance. Well, I once had an exclusive years ago with the CEO at the time, who is now the Transport Minister. He's a friend, Mr. Bautista, really, really lovely guy, and he gave me the exclusive that they were in active discussions with Star Alliance in the process of joining Star Alliance, and I broke that exclusive in 2019 that Philippine Airlines is set to join Star Alliance, and I still get. Website pings to this article five six years later that people are actively googling it, finding it, and then you know, <laughs> and expecting. But it hasn't happened. It never、yeah. happened. And of course, he's no longer the CEO, and God knows what happened. But they never joined, and that would be, you know, they wanted Star. I think actually, I remember him saying to me he wanted One World, and、mm. then they just couldn't, and so they were thinking that they could fit nicely in Star. If I were them, I, I would opt for Star. That could be a that could be nice. Yeah, the, this is a fun game, kind of shaping our global air travel. And you know, the interesting thing people don't realize is that an airline can't just join an alliance. There are there are many criteria, but also the worst part is the founding members are allowed to veto, so an airline、yeah. can't join. It's which, literally you can't sit with us. Yeah, gaming. You know, which w- this is not public information. They obviously don't share if an airline vetoes,、no. but. Behind the scenes, <laughs> we do suspect that Cathay Pacific has played a role in stopping at least one airline, possibly a few, from joining One World who want to, but、yeah. they're kind of too close for Cathay Pacific to like that, which is such、yeah. a shame. I also heard that in the Alan Joyce days, Qantas were pretty vocal about who was, you know, looking at coming in and who wasn't, and there were there were even talks a long while ago about Turkish. Jumping ship and、Oof. looking like yeah, can you imagine and thinking、How、about、amazing. you know would would there be a future of Turkish in one world and I, and I think that was the example where in Australia Alan Joyce, if I'm remembering correctly and I'm willing to be corrected on this, I'm going to double check with my source, but I think I remember him being a bit vocal about that and they are able to veto it and it has to be respected,、uh, even if they're not founding members by the way, even if they're just you know members of the alliance, it is kind of taken seriously as to as to. Who they want, and that's why you see sometimes airlines in the same markets. For example, Royal Jordanian are in the Middle East. Qatar、yeah. Airways are in the Middle East. Qatar fine with Royal Jordanian being there, of course, because Royal Jordanian are tiny compared、yeah. to the likes of QR and so on. So that's typically why that、uh, why that ends up happening. Who we've got Iberia in one world. You've、yeah. got Tap it, in Star. Isn't it interesting? I just have to say, I was thinking about like I was like, oh, Star Alliance is so overrepresented. Like, there's so many. Good airlines and Star Alliance.、Mm. That is unfair. But then I was like, actually, that's only the case in Asia. Like they have SQ, ANA, Thai Airways. They have a lot of good ones. But if you go to Europe, I would say personally that Star Alliance actually has overall the worst group of airlines in Europe because there,、mm. Air France, KLM, definitely more premium, especially Air France, British Airways. Solid. You have Finnair, one、mm. of my faves. Iberia,、mm, but I don't know. I just feel like it is. And then you go to the U.S. There, I would say Star Alliance is a bit stronger with United, and their One World is actually the worst alliance, just because you have Alaska, which is good, but you're stuck on one coast. But then you have you're stuck with American otherwise. So it's so dependent where you live, which alliance is right for you, and. Sadly, that might not always be the air, the alliance with the best airlines where you do live, but they might be on the other side of the world. Who asked this question? A、uh, James. Great question, James. Thank you for that. Keep them, <laughs> yeah, keep them coming. We enjoyed that one. That's loads of、uh, of food for thought.、Uh, I've got a question here from. William, he says, "Hey Alex, trust all is well. I've got a question for the podcast. If that's all right, I was wondering, given that BA was one of the largest operators of the seven four seven four hundred, why did they opt for the A three eighty and not the seven four seven dash eight? I would have thought that the line train、uh, that the that line trainer and other operational costs would have been cheaper instead of buying all the infrastructure needed to service and train on the A three eighty. Big fan of the podcast and keep up the fantastic work, William." Um, 
I, I do actually know the answer to this because this is a discussion that I had quite a while ago, well, years ago, with uh, some friends at uh, BA Management. And a lot of the decision behind the reason to choose the A380 versus the 747 Dash 8 is because well, there were a few reasons, as is common, when you pin one aircraft against the other. It was a, a decision, and the A380 came out on top in terms of what it was able to offer BA. It did seem at the time, and I think it lived up to then go on to be true, that there were no, there were not enough competitive advantages to justify replacing a 747-400 with a 747-8. Then there was when you compared, for example, that to the likes of what the A380 could offer. So on paper, they were able to just get more out of the A380, way more than what this Dash 8 could ever do to replace the, the, the older jumbo jets. One of the most significant contributors I remember at the time was commonality with engines and the fact that BA wanted aircraft with Rolls-Royce engines and that was only really an option on what was then the upcoming A380, which was one of the biggest reasons as to why BA committed early on from the A380. It was going for as much commonality as it could in terms of engines and the suppliers of the engines and the Rolls-Royce are available on 380s and that's... Uh, probably what had uh, them move a little closer to signing that deal. Yeah, good answer. I have one last question here from Andrew. I like this question. He says, hey, Dan, and guest host Alex, finally, it's reversed. I don't, I don't like this listener. Do we have <laughs> I love to do you, this Andrew. question? <laughs> you're, you're safe on my side of the podcast. So he says, I don't think Andrew exists. I think Andrew's in your head. I need a <laughs> screenshot to my WhatsApp right now. <laughs> I don't, you, I don't need to send you proof. Andrew knows he's real. So Andrew wow, says, okay. um, I have a question for you guys. This is more of a very specific question, but I think it's fun just to discuss. So Go to on. fly from Europe to Japan, what would we choose? a 777, a 787, or Lufthansa 747? And which one in which direction? Andrew. Wait, what are the options? Say again. So Lufthansa triple, no, not Lufthansa 777. In what world? Um, <laughs> A and A 777. In one, in one world. <laughs> oh, no, in what yeah. world? So, okay, <laughs> anyway. A and A 777, okay. A and A 787, or okay. Lufthansa 747. Okay. Hmm. A and A 777, I think. Yeah, that's the obvious yeah. answer. Unless yeah. you're someone who hasn't flown the 747 before, this is yeah. like a once in a lifetime chance to do it. Go for that one way, but hello, A and A triple seven, obvious way to go above ninety five percent of other airlines. <laughs> if you ever yeah. have a question where A and A triple seven is one of the options, I would just say choose that. You don't need to ask. I've got a, a quick. It's not a question, but it's a message here from Kat. She says, "Hi, Alex. My husband and I just missed you by minutes in Zurich Airport when I was there transiting a couple of weeks ago." We are regular listeners. She's but we are regular listeners for your podcast with Dan. So when we heard when you were at Zurich, we got all excited and said we were in the same airport at the same time. Uh, uh. I also received another message from a listener called Dan who said, "Hey Alex, you zoomed past me at <laughs> Zurich, but I couldn't catch you up. I wanted to say hi." Save travels. Yeah, this is a problem. By the way, I always look like I'm in a rush. So if yeah. this is, Dan knows this. Please, if guys, if you're listeners and you and you see us out in the wild, definitely say hi. Stop us. We'd love to have conversation. And I'm probably almost certainly not late. I just always give this impression because I walk fast and yeah. I'm yeah, speeding from A to B. So one other I thing out to on add. Dan. Which I think yeah. maybe you're not even aware of, Alex, is that oh, not only does Alex always look like he's in a rush, he looks like he thinks he's being followed by someone. <laughs> <laughs> like you always, That's not true. you're walking super fast and you're kind of looking around in this way of like, is someone, someone coming to no, get me? No, that's just so... when you're around. That's just when <laughs> oh, okay. you're around. Okay. And also, also, I, I will, this is, I will stand firmly on this. I don't look rushed. For example, you know those people that walk fast, but they're flustered with it. That's yeah. awful. Okay. Just naturally, I take big strides, big steps. My my friends have to remind me, hey, hey, walk. We're I not know. running. We're not late for something. You, know, you take so. as big steps as you can when you're less than six feet. You do your best. 
excuse me, we're not going to have you in these last minutes of this episode try to imply that I'm somehow not tall. <laughs> <laughs> well, depends who you compare it to, that's all. On well, that note... You're you're a giant. <laughs> I'm a six foot two, guys, so let's... I, I just, I'm just reminded of how beautiful it is that we don't have to meet every week for the podcast and we do it remotely because... <laughs> <laughs> you don't have Honestly. to feel short every Tuesday, is that... Everybody it, feels short around you, even even the tallest people, even NBA basketball players. Okay. So, yeah. I do love meeting someone who's taller than me because it's like such a humbling experience, you know? Yeah, it's rare though, isn't it? Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It depends where, but definitely in New York, it's not the most common. So I'm going to go out and yell at someone on the street to, you know, embrace my New York side. And then and I'm going to go grab a bagel and uh, probably get chased to- by someone on drugs. <laughs> This is because you're in New York City. Yeah. Yes. That's not what I do just every day. My afternoon routine. I just assumed you were describing Gothenburg. I didn't didn't think anything anything else of it. Okay. Well, on that note, I will wish you good night from Europe. And we'll regroup this time next week. Kalinista, Alex. Kalinista. Good night. See you. Bye-bye. See you next week on air. Bye.